This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Methane. You like it, I like it, the EPA hates it, and cow farts are made from it. Methane is the lightest hydrocarbon, so light in fact that it's lighter than air. Of course, that also means it has a pretty low density, so it sucks for powering things that go brrrr unless you compress it to a ridiculously high pressure and put it in a heavy steel tank. But to get it into the same energy density ballpark as, say, gasoline or diesel, you have to condense methane into a liquid. This is what liquid natural gas, or LNG, is. Not to be confused with LPG, which is liquid petroleum gas, which is a mixture of propane and butane. Unlike LPG, which can be condensed at room temperature at around 5 to 10 atmospheres of pressure depending on the composition, LNG, which is mostly methane, condenses at minus 162 C, although it can be stored as high as minus 90 C or so at around 35 atmospheres of pressure. Global demand for LNG has been growing over the past few decades. Most new rocket designs burn LNG instead of kerosene, and it's very possible that we'll see LNG-fueled aircraft in the not-so-distant future. This is because liquid methane offers most of the advantages of liquid hydrogen, but without the drawbacks. Both can be synthesized from green energy, burn extremely clean, and have a higher energy content per unit mass than typical fuels like gasoline, kerosene, or diesel. However, liquid hydrogen has to be unbelievably cold, just 22 degrees above absolute zero, so the energy cost to bring it down to this temperature and condense it on an industrial scale is astronomical. Also, its density is only about 7% that of water, even in liquid form, so the volumetric energy density of it kind of sucks. It'll also embrittle metals and can't be sealed indefinitely because it will diffuse through solid material, so forget about using it for long duration space missions. Liquid methane, on the other hand, has a density of about 45% that of water, and compared to hydrogen or even nitrogen, it's relatively easy to liquefy and keep cold with a good refrigeration setup, which is what I'm going to show you in this video. To reach the temperatures necessary to condense the methane, I'll be using my mixed gas Joule Thompson cryocooler from several videos ago. This was made to liquefy nitrogen, but I'm going to try methane first because it should be easier. If you didn't see my videos on the mixed gas Joule Thompson cycle, here's a quick summary. When a compressed gas is expanded to a lower pressure, it cools down. The temperature drop is based on its Joule Thompson coefficient given in degrees per bar. The Joule Thompson effect becomes larger at lower temperatures, so cold low pressure gas is used to precool the incoming high pressure gas in a long counterflow heat exchanger, which in turn causes its temperature to drop even further, creating a positive feedback effect that gets you down to cryogenic temperatures. Now in theory it's pretty simple, the only problem is, if you're doing this with something like pure nitrogen or methane, to get them to liquefy you usually need a very high pressure compressor, over 200 bar or 3000 psi for nitrogen for example. As a hobbyist it's hard to find equipment that can produce or contain those pressures and if something breaks it can be lethal. But there's a sneaky workaround for this problem. Broadly speaking, as the molecular weight of a gas increases, its Joule Thompson coefficient tends to become larger, not always but usually. For example, the coefficient for nitrogen at room temperature is about 0.19 degrees C per bar, but for carbon dioxide it's around 1.4, and for propane it's 2.1. You see where I'm going with this? So what you do is you put a mixture of gases in your refrigeration cycle, typically a blend of propane, ethylene or ethane, methane, and argon or nitrogen. By having a mixture, the cycle can keep progressing down to lower temperatures without bottoming out from phase change. In the research I've done, I found that most mixed gas JT systems bottom out between minus 175 to minus 185 C. The lowest I've gotten on mine is minus 180, although that wasn't sustained. The kicker is that this can be done at high side pressures between just 20 to 30 atmospheres. That's an order of magnitude lower than typical pure gas systems, and it can be done with a regular old air conditioning compressor. These temperatures are more than enough to liquefy methane with its boiling point at minus 162 C. Nitrogen, on the other hand, would have to be pressurized to liquefy it, but only to a few atmospheres, so it's not a big deal. So that's how the cryocooler works, but where do we get the methane from? Okay, so I have a confession. I'm using the natural gas coming into my house, so this isn't 100% pure methane, it's probably between 90 to 95%. The remaining portion is ethylene, ethane, or propane, and a very tiny amount of mercaptan to make it smell horrible. However, for all intents and purposes, natural gas is methane, and I'll be using the terms interchangeably. If natural gas that's not 100% pure methane is good enough for giant moon rockets, it's good enough for me. Okay, anyway, to extract the natural gas, I've just got a flex hose I got from the hardware store, the same kind you use to hook up a furnace or a water heater. On the other end, I've got a hodgepodge of different adapters that lead to a quarter inch flare fitting which can be connected to a refrigerant hose. 
I have gas heat, but I live in Florida, so 51 weeks out of the year it's not being used. So I'll just have my adapter line connected in place of the line for the furnace. Then I hook up my refrigerant hose from the adapter to my compressor and from my compressor to a former propane tank. If you're doing this, I recommend using a filter dryer in line with the compressor output to scrub out any traces of moisture. I charge the tank to about 160 psi or 12 bar, which is what the tank would have experienced with propane inside of it on a hot summer day. Now these tanks will actually take a lot more pressure than that, but I want to play it safe. Oh yeah, speaking of safety, I don't recommend that anybody do this because both gaseous and liquid methane are insanely flammable and one mistake could end up with you being blown into the shadow realm. This is being done purely for demonstrational purposes because to be honest, liquid methane doesn't have much of a practical use for hobbyists. Anyway, now that I've got some tanks of volatile fart gas, there's a little work that needs to be done on the cryocooler. For one, I swapped compressors so that the 5000 BTU compressor is now on the pre-cooler stage and the 12000 BTU compressor is on the main Joule Thompson stage. The two don't look much different, but this one is more than twice as powerful as this one. I also removed the electronic expansion valve because it added unnecessary complexity to the system and I replaced it with about half a meter of 1mm inner diameter capillary tubing. This will be the flow resistance or throttle for the Joule Thompson cycle. I also installed a much larger filter dryer because some of my homemade gases have a little too much residual moisture in them which would cause clogs in the cold end so I needed more desiccant to scrub that stuff out. I'm also no longer attempting to use vacuum for the cold end insulation and instead just using a ton of foam and glass wool. This makes the whole system simpler and cheaper. So the way this is set up is I've got the regenerative heat exchanger from the last video which is just about 20 feet of 316 inch copper tubing inside of 3 8 inch copper tubing. On its way back up the heat exchanger the cold low pressure gas takes a detour through a coil that runs through a large section of copper pipe which will be the chamber where I condense cryogenic liquids. This pipe has like 60 to 70 cc of internal volume, so I pump a bunch of gas in and wait for it to liquefy rather than continuously feeding it through a heat exchanger, which didn't really work when I tried it. Once most or all the gas has liquefied, I discharge the liquid through this siphon tube into a thermos for collection. For methane, this will happen somewhere around minus 130 to minus 140 C. Of course, methane can condense at a higher temperature than this, but it requires a higher pressure, and when it's discharged, a larger percentage will be lost to evaporation because it'll have to cool down more to reach equilibrium at one atmosphere. I actually did a bunch of tests to figure out what kind of thermal load I can put on the system by slapping some silicon heater pads onto the cold end of the system and mapping out temperature versus load in watts. It changes a lot depending on what gas mix you use. I tested several different gas compositions and came up with this graph that shows low temperature versus power. The best mix I tested was 20% propane, 25% ethylene, 10% methane, and 45% nitrogen, which went down to minus 158C unloaded. Now that sounds pretty cold, but it's actually kind of crap because a mixed gas Joule Thompson cycle should be able to get down close to minus 180C without that much trouble, so I think I have some work to do on my insulation before I liquefy nitrogen. That'll be good enough for liquefying methane right now though, so let's give it a shot. But before I liquefy this fart gas, I need some science money, so let me tell you about this video sponsor, Brilliant. Do you want to learn STEM topics in a fun and interactive way and not just from some unqualified ex-convict on YouTube who uses stupid MS Paint animations? Then you should try Brilliant. Brilliant lets you learn topics like math, physics, coding, or data science with an interface that's like a video game which makes the learning experience fun and engaging. The best part is that it's set up so that you can take lessons in bite-sized chunks of a few minutes at a time so you don't have to set aside multiple hours a day like with a regular class. Lunch break? Smoke break? Poop break? Bust out that phone and knock out a quick lesson on Brilliant. Before long you'll be a master of that topic without having to set foot in a stuffy college classroom. Visit brilliant.org slash hyperspacepirate for a free 30 day trial and 20% off an annual premium subscription. Okay, now back to the fart gas. I'm feeding the natural gas I collected from my tank to my compressor and into the cold end of the cryocooler. We're showing about 370 psi or 26 bar at minus 105C, so that's right on track for condensation. After I shut off the compressor, the pressure of the liquid methane falls as the temperature falls. The pressure approximately corresponds to the condensation temperature, so I know I've got saturated liquid inside. I'm going to stick this thermocouple on the outlet of my discharge valve and open it up to see what happens. What you're seeing there is a stream of liquid natural gas flashing to vapor as it hits the warm atmosphere. If it was pure methane, it would bottom out at minus 162C, but because it's mixed with a few percent of higher boiling hydrocarbons, we only see minus 159C. Nevertheless, it's still a cryogenic liquid, and if that got on my hands without gloves, I'd probably end up with a pretty awful case of frostbite. Let's repeat this experiment, but this time I'll try to collect some of it in a thermos. 
As you can see, most of the fluid just evaporates when I discharge it straight out of the valve because there's no flow restriction or baffles. So whatever liquid does go into the thermos, most of it just gets blasted back out from the high pressure discharge and flashes back to vapor. I did still manage to catch a few drops of liquid though. You can see them gliding across the garage floor from the laden frost effect. Let's try that again with a bit of flow restriction. You can see that the boil off is substantial. Everything electronic was turned off when I did this to avoid ignition sources because that's a cloud of cold but extremely flammable gas. It's still not very much liquid though, it immediately boiled off. On a third attempt, I actually gave the liquid enough time to cool to nearly its one atmosphere boiling point so that there would be less boil off during discharge, and I managed to get a little bit more but it was still only 10 to 20 cc's. To get more liquid I think I'm going to need a bigger reservoir and better insulation on the cold end to get more heat lift. I pulled the counterflow heat exchanger out of its container, removed all the glass wool, and cut off the cold end so that I was left with the bare copper heat exchanger. This is the original cold head that holds the cryo liquid. Not very big as you can see since it's just a 1 inch pipe section. I'm going to replace it with a 2.5 inch copper pipe that looks kind of like a Chipotle burrito because the ends are folded in to seal it. This should have close to 700 cc's of holding capacity for liquid. I also significantly upgraded the insulation. Stuffing glass wool around bare copper was pretty ineffective, so I actually wrapped the copper with foam tubing, taped it off so that it was sealed, and filled the gaps with styrofoam, which is more effective than glass wool. The end result almost looks like a professional piece of equipment. Almost. With the improved insulation, the system got as far down as minus 179C and momentarily hit minus 180C, but I didn't manage to capture it on camera. This is much closer to the performance that we should be seeing from a mixed gas tool Thompson system. For the methane feed, I also made this heat exchanger that connects to the system's pre-cooler to bring the feed down to about minus 25C before it enters the cryo cooler. This will help freeze out any residual moisture and reduce the energy requirement for liquefying the gas. Okay, let's try this again. This time I took the liquid below minus 140 before discharging and used a capillary tube with a baffle to preserve as much of the liquid in the thermos as possible. Completely discharging the cold reservoir took several minutes. The empty thermos weighs 452 grams, and after discharge it weighed 573, so I collected 121 grams of liquid methane, which is a massive improvement. What you see being poured out here is only half the contents of the thermos. The density of liquid methane is a very low 45% of water, so that means the total volume of liquid should be about 267 cc's. It took around 20 minutes to liquefy this much. But wait, can we make it freeze? The triple point of methane occurs at 0.12 atmospheres, which should be easy to reach with a vacuum pump. In theory, if I put this under vacuum, that should force extra evaporation, causing the methane to freeze at 90 Kelvin or about minus 183C. Let's put this liquid in my vacuum chamber and see what happens. Immediately you can see more vapor getting pulled off as I start to evacuate the chamber. So I got well below the triple point pressure of 0.12 atmospheres and the bubbles are starting to look much bigger, but unfortunately I didn't see any of the methane freeze. After around 20 minutes in the vacuum chamber, most of the methane had just boiled off. As you can see, there's a major cold spot on the bottom of the chamber, so I think there was just too much heat being conducted out through the chamber wall, preventing the methane from getting cold enough to freeze. Also, I suspect that ambient infrared was probably warming the sample up a lot too, so I'll have to try that experiment again with some reflective foil over the chamber and some form of insulation to prevent the sample from conducting too much heat. I've still got over 100 cc's of liquid left, so let's see what happens when it's ignited. The liquid methane cracked the glass container from the extreme temperature difference. I guess I should have thought that one through. As you can see, it's ridiculously flammable. You definitely wouldn't want a dewar full of this stuff just sitting around in your garage. I was going to make more liquid for another attempt at freezing, but disaster struck and the cryo cooler exploded at around 400 psi, causing the walls of the insulation box to blow out. Looks like most of the damage was near the bottom. The seam weld on the burrito seems to have ruptured under pressure. That's what I get for not using proper end caps. Here's a close up look at the damage. Fortunately, the rest of the cryo cooler seems to be intact. I guess I'll have to leave solid methane for the next video. Next time I'll try to build this properly and use an actual end cap instead of just trying to pinch the ends together and braze the seam shut. Now let's talk a little bit about numbers. Before I improved my insulation, I managed to get a ballpark idea of what sort of heat lift I'm working with, but those tests probably gave an extremely conservative estimate because there's a major heat transfer bottleneck going from the low pressure cold pipe to the outside wall of the liquid reservoir. 
Gas being condensed inside the reservoir would be in direct contact with a low pressure cold pipe, whereas heat being applied from a test load on the outside wall would have to travel through the relatively thin cross section of the wall through the cap and contact the cold pipe in a relatively small area at the brace joint. Part of this could be solved in testing by filling the pipe with a liquid hydrocarbon like propane to transfer heat to the walls a little bit better, but liquid hydrocarbons are pretty poor heat conductors compared to something like water, so I think I still wasn't getting a very good picture. Also, the fact that I got a whopping 20 degrees colder unloaded with the same power input after improving my insulation shows that these test results are pretty much useless. To get a better idea of heat lift, I measured how quickly I liquefied gas when pumping it into my larger, better insulated liquid reservoir. In a timed test, I emptied a 5 gallon tank charged to 160 psi with natural gas. Doing the conversion to mass and using metric units, that equates to 134.7 grams of methane. It took 13 minutes to liquefy that amount of mass at an average load temperature of minus 118C and a pressure of 12 bar. At 12 bar, going from a gas at 25C to a 100% saturated liquid would require 750 kilojoules per kilogram of energy to be removed. That means the cryocooler removed 101 kilojoules of heat. Dividing that by 13 minutes comes out to 130 watts of heat lift at minus 118C. This was with an input power of 1300 watts, so the coefficient of performance was 0.1 or 10%, which is approximately 9.4% of Carnot efficiency for a theoretical refrigerator. The unloaded temperature for this particular gas mix was minus 153C. The mix was 30% propane, 40% methane, and 30% argon, so it didn't quite get cold enough for liquid nitrogen. Using linear interpolation, the load temperature versus power graph would look something like this. To estimate what the heat lift curve would look like for a mix geared toward liquid nitrogen, I'm going to do a little extrapolation guesswork and assume a constant relationship of percent Carnot versus degrees above unloaded temperature. And here's what the theoretical graph looks like for heat lift with a gas mix where the unloaded temperature is minus 175C, just under 60 watts at minus 150C, which is the maximum temperature at which we can start to liquefy nitrogen. That would put the system at a coefficient of performance of 4.4%, which at minus 150C is about 6% of Carnot, which pretty much agrees with the graphs of cryocooler performance I found on the interwebs. That's it for now. In the next video, I should have frozen methane, liquid air, and then it'll be time to spin up some superconductors. Okay, that's the, that's the end of the video. You can, you can go now. Bye.